In the last slide, we talked about the motivations behind uh, European exploration of the world, particularly when it came to God, gold, and glory. Uh, when we talked about how all those interrelated with one another. Now we're going to talk about the means. How are Europeans able to do the things that they were able to do? How were they able to, uh, to sail long distances suddenly in the 15th century and then beyond? By the end of the 15th century, Europeans had achieved a level of wealth and technology that enabled them to undertake frequent voyages to lands beyond Europe. By the end of the 15th century, for example, we have cartography, maps that are developing to the point that Europeans possess a better knowledge of the world than ever before. Moreover, we have more reliable seaworthy ships along with long-distance navigation techniques, the compass, the astrolabe, and of course the cross staff. Europeans understood wind directions a lot better as well. Uh, for example, in the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, they, under they discovered that wind patterns uh, in these two oceans are very similar. In both of these oceans, between 5 and 25 degrees north and south of the, of the, of the equator, winds blew from the, west, from the east. Now you go north of those, or south of those, if you're in the south, southern hemisphere, and you, you would see that between the 30th and 60th degree of latitude, you would have winds that are blowing from the west. This pattern also exists in the Indian Ocean, particularly, but it's usually about the months. For example, between April and October, the monsoon winds are going to drive the, the winds blowing from the southwest, and in the winter, those winds are going to blow from the northeast. Now, Portugal leads the, takes the lead in exploring the coast of Africa under the leadership of a man named Henry the Navigator, or Prince Henry the Navigator. Shortly hereafter, uh, in 1419, Prince Henry establishes a, a school of navigation for teaching Portuguese captains how to navigate throughout the world. Shortly thereafter, Portuguese fleets are going to move south along the western coast of Africa in the search for gold. In 1441, Portuguese ships are going to reach the Senegal River, uh, just north of Cape Verde, and bring home a cargo of black Africans, most of them who will then be sold as w slaves to wealthy buyers elsewhere in Europe. And within a few years, a thousand slaves will be shipped annually from Africa back to Portugal. Through regular exploration, the Portuguese are going to gradually creep down the, east, the coast of Africa. In 1471, they discover a new source of gold along the western coast uh, in an area that Europeans are going to, be call, they're going to call it the Gold Coast. A few years later, they establish contact with the state of Bakongo near the Zaire River. And to facilitate the trade, uh, the Portuguese would purchase land from the local rulers and build stone forts along the coast. Now, hearing reports of, in, of water routes to India around the southern tip of Africa, the Portuguese sea captains continued going. In 1487, Bartholomew Diaz rounds the Cape of Good Hope, and shortly after, Vasco da Gama surpasses that by going around the Cape, skirting the coast of Africa, the eastern coast of Africa, and then cutting across the Indian Ocean and landing in India itself. Now, she would bring, he would bring back a cargo of pepper, precious stones, and made a handsome profit on these valuable goods. The Gama's successful water route marked the beginning of an all-water route to India. After the Gama's return, Portugal is going to send a larger fleet to, in to the east. Despite opposition from the Muslim traders that are there in West India, the ships managed to return with valuable cargo. One contemporary describes it as this. Cinnamon, fresh and dried ginger, much pepper, cloves, nutmeg, mace, musk, porcelains, incense, myrrh, red and white sandalwood, opium, India paper, and a great variety of drugs. I saw many diamonds, rubies, and pearls. So by, the 15, by 1500, the Portuguese are starting to undercut the previous monopoly holders of the Venetians and the Turks. They were the middlemen, or not necessarily maybe the end men, because there were plenty of middlemen to bring the goods over into, say, Venice. But nonetheless, the middlemen was was cut out, and therefore prices are going to start dropping in in uh, in Europe. Now the Portuguese would soon create an overseas empire. They reached beyond India uh, in taking the island of Macau at the no mouth of the Pearl River in China. And their empire was limited to trading posts on the coast of India and China. 
The Portuguese possessed neither the power nor the desire to colonize these ancient regions. So why are they so successful? Uh, I'll offer two reasons. We should assume that, that those that the Portuguese traded with found it mutually profitable. The Portuguese would offer European goods, wine, wool, olive oil, steel, and firearms, which have, must have been just interested mar uh, merchants in the feast foreign ports. So trade thrives as it always does, because each gets something of value from the, to, from the other. Portuguese success is also a matter of guns and seamanship. The first Portuguese fleet to arrive on the Indian coast was relatively small, three ships, 20 guns, but a force that was, that was going to be uh, large enough for self-defense and intimidation, but not necessarily for serious military operations. Later Portuguese fleets, however, were much more heavily armed and could inflict severe defeats if necessary on local and land forces. So these are some of the reasons why the Portuguese were so able to establish a trading empire as extensive as it was, despite its relatively small uh, size in terms of population.